Kia ora, g'day and welcome to the history of Aotearoa New Zealand. Episode 53, Wheat and Potatoes. This podcast is supported by our amazing patrons. If you want to support Hans, go to patreon.com slash history Aotearoa. Last time, we talked about some of the foodstuffs Māori were foraging rather than growing themselves, such as aruhe, fern root, and tea, cabbage tree. This time, we're going to talk about what happened after European arrival in regards to food and horticulture, because there were, of course, a lot of new and different plants that were being introduced. In turn, this affected many aspects of Māori culture in general. By 1839, the year before the Treaty of Waitangi was signed, northern iwi, that is to say north of modern Auckland, had been exposed the most to European contact, along with the goods and cultural influence that comes with it. So naturally, their culture, and more specifically their horticultural practices, looked quite different to more southern Māori, or even those that lived more inland. The main changes that occurred were the introduction of potatoes, wheat, maize and various other fruit and veg, new metal tools that made their work much more efficient, and new animals like pigs and other livestock. This all led to a general change of culture, not only in farming methods, but diet and attitudes around spirituality and tapu. The access to increased trade also resulted in a shift in the Māori subsistence economy as a whole. Don't worry though, we will explain what that all means as we go along. Let's start with the crop that probably changed Māori culture the most, and in fact has had a large impact all across the globe, from its cultivation in the Americas by indigenous peoples, all the way to its introduction to Europe in the 16th century. According to Wikipedia, it is the fourth largest food crop in the world, and is integral to the modern world's food supply if you haven't guessed already, is the cousin of the kumara, the potato. Potatoes were likely introduced to Aotearoa by Cook on his second voyage in 1773, and Dufresne in 1772, along with a bunch of other crops like rice, peas, maize, wheat, corn and beans. According to the article that is one of the major sources for this episode, potatoes weren't readily accepted by Māori for a few years after their initial introduction. The article claims that this was due to Māori trying to eat potatoes raw, which is obviously not super tasty. However, I rather doubt the validity of this. It doesn't really add up. As we will later see, Māori recognised that potatoes and kumara were quite similar, and so chose to grow potatoes in the same way they did kumara, with the mounds and the digging and crews and gardens and all of that. I don't see why they would make this connection in regards to planting and growing and not make the same connection with cooking and eating. It just, again, doesn't make sense to me. Regardless of whether they took to it quickly or not, by 1801 Māori had extensive fields of potatoes after they had been traded from Europeans or traded between iwi after this, which is the way more inland iwi, like Tūhoi, were able to acquire them. Two years later, in 1803, a trading ship that came to New Zealand purchased around 8 tonnes of potatoes off Māori that they had grown, so it was pretty clear that production had ramped up swiftly. By the 1830s, the potato had overtaken the kumara as the main crop in Aotearoa, which was for a number of reasons, including increased tolerance to cold and its ability to store a lot easier than its cousin, or sibling, I guess. Remember, both potatoes and kumara actually came from the same part of the world. They just took the long way round to get to the South Pacific. By this time, Europeans had also brought over lots of other crops too, such as cereal grains. However, Māori didn't take to these as much as they did with the potato, given the latter was something that they were familiar with and already had the technology to reproduce. Now, the assumption would be that the reason Māori were growing so many potatoes was that they were eating lots of them, as a replacement for the foods that they had been eating for hundreds of years. This isn't really correct though. There likely was a decrease in the amount of kumara, fern root and other plants being eaten due to an increased variety of crops available, but we don't see a total rejection of the old ways, 
This was the thinking for some time, that potatoes, and European crops in general, just supplanted Māori foods, and that pre-European Māori were eating the foods that they did because they literally had nothing else available. The implication being that European crops were superior. Best talks about how potatoes are the sole reason Fernroot left the Māori diet, and how potatoes basically destroyed their fishing, fowling and foraging practices, due to no longer needing to go out and find food daily. Again, what we will actually see is that Fernroot and Taro stuck around for quite some time after European arrival, though yams do seem to have disappeared by about 1839. So, back to my original point, if they weren't eating them, what the fuck were they doing with all them taters? Well, as it turns out, Māori pretty quickly realised that, even though they were probably pretty indifferent to potatoes themselves, Europeans bloody loved them. And as it so happened, more and more Europeans were coming out to their neck of the woods, At first, it was mostly sealers and whalers looking for that good, good blubber, but eventually it was traders, who had the intention of exporting Māori potatoes and other goods to Sydney, and then from there, settlers, all of whom needed potatoes to feed themselves, and were willing to pay for it with goods that Māori needed. This was going pretty well for a while, but it had some pretty major effects on the Māori way of life. Up until this point, Māori culture was mostly a subsistence economy. Basically, that it was based on how much you had of the base resources for life, such as food and shelter, and of course, your ability to defend those, as opposed to a moneyed economy with coins and such. This was rapidly changing though. Trading this new cash crop, as well as things like toimoko, harakeke products, and other unique items to Aotearoa, for things like muskets, new foods, tools, and eventually, coins. In short, the Māori economy was becoming more commercialised, and as such, was more at the whims of the market and its forces, rather than being based on the productivity of your land and your ability to defend that land. This is a really huge oversimplification of a very complex economic idea, but I hope it somewhat explains kinda what was happening. This commercialising of the economy also led to Māori wanting to dig their potatoes up earlier than they normally would, so they could take hold of good trading opportunities. This of course led to the potatoes being smaller and declining in quality. This was exasperated by the fact that Māori don't seem to have known about selective breeding, in that you should keep your largest potatoes to plant for the next year, and then, over time, you'll see your crop generally being larger due to the only potatoes being able to reproduce are the biggest ones. It should be reiterated that I'm not trying to have a dig at Māori for not knowing this concept. It's just the way things were. As we mentioned before, Māori were trading European goods with other iwi, meaning that some Māori got a hold of these foreign items long before they had ever seen someone who was white. This mostly occurred in inland areas like the Uruweta and Taupo, where Europeans didn't really have access to unless they took a long trek into the interior. For Tūhoi, the iwi whose rohe is in the Uruweta, and iwi in the South Island, potatoes were a pretty huge deal, even bigger than for those on the coast. Both these areas couldn't really grow kumara, and relied heavily on catching birds or foraging, with tūhoi also having to forego the other Māori dietary staple of fish and shellfish, due to their inland location. This trade into the deeper regions of Aotearoa before the arrival of Europeans into the area meant that locals didn't realise these items had come from across the ocean. Some thought that these new items had always been here, and that they just hadn't seen them before. So a bunch of kōrero started to crop up, explaining how things like potatoes were always grown here. There were of course heaps of other crops that Europeans brought over as well, 
Some we have briefly mentioned already, but there were others like cabbage, pumpkin, radish, onions, turnips, parsnips, carrots, cucumbers, and watermelons. These were also grown by Māori and sold to European traders, travellers, and settlers, though to a much lesser extent than potatoes. This seems to have been down to the fact that these plants were generally quite different to what Māori were used to, as opposed to the more familiar potato, but also that they just weren't in as much demand by Europeans. Essentially, those market forces were coming into play there. There were also instances of Europeans planting crops themselves across the country, but these were generally left unattended and quickly became wild from lack of care. This was obviously a pretty big problem, because it meant that these plants started to run rampant in their new environment that was just not prepared for them. In the case of cabbage, it had such a great time in the Bay of Islands, someone said, quote, you would suppose it was an indigenous plant of the country, end quote. Turnip was quickly in the same position as well. When it came to grains and cereals that were brought to Aotearoa, only wheat and maize were widely adopted by 1838. Wheat was introduced in 1769 by de Serville, another French fuller who was exploring the Pacific, all roughly around the time as Cook and Dufresne. De Serville explained to Māori how to plant and cultivate wheat, but it wasn't really that successful. Again, this was down to the fact that Māori didn't really have a familiar point of reference, as well as the not-so-insignificant factor of the language barrier. Remember, Māori had only just met these guys. The closest thing they had to a translator was Tupaya, a Tahitian on Cook's first voyage. It wouldn't be until the 1810s that wheat was likely grown by Māori with any sort of effort successfully. The man who did this was a quote-unquote northern chief by the name of Ruatara, who went to a European farm to learn how to cultivate the grain and then returned with some seeds and the knowledge, spreading them around to other neighbouring chiefs. This ended up being pretty successful, except for the fact that the chiefs expected the edible part of the plant to be underground, as they were used to with potato and kumara. So instead of chopping the top off like Europeans did, these guys pulled the plants up with the idea that something would be underneath them. Despite this minor setback, Ruatara got the wheat ground down into flour for use as bread, which was great. Unfortunately, he died in 1815, and after him, there wasn't really anyone interested enough to try work European crops to Māori advantage. That is, until David Taiwanga of Kaikohe decided to take up the mantle in the late 1820s. I wasn't able to find much on this bloke. But as far as I can tell, in the realm of Māori farming, Taiwanga was an absolute juggernaut. By this time, he already had a farm growing a variety of European crops, and by the 1830s was mostly using European methods of farming, like using ploughs and storing wheat in a barn, as well as raising cattle. This was highly unusual for Māori chiefs at the time, and as such, Taiwanga was a pioneer in every sense of the word. For the time being, let's get back to wheat, which, for pretty much the entire pre-Waitangi period, missionaries were doing their darndest to convince Māori that it was the best thing since hangi. Sometimes the missionaries would do a bit of a demonstration and plant the seeds themselves, showing Māori what to do at the various stages. And other times, Māori would plant it themselves, saying that they would totally follow their instructions and were definitely going to give them a call to show off all the fantastic baking they had done. In reality, the wheat was never really managed or harvested, and Māori were just planting the seeds to get the Bible bashes off their back. And I think we can all kinda relate to that in a way, especially when the gist of their argument is pretty well summed up in the following excerpt. Quote, We cannot cultivate wheat, nor do we wish to cultivate it, because it is attended with so much labour, and has to go through so many processes before it can be eaten as bread. If we clear a piece of land and plant it with sweet potatoes, we get a good crop of food, which we like, and which we can eat immediately out of the ground, end quote. And you know what? It's hard to argue with that logic. 
The missionaries weren't to be so easily dissuaded though. They thought that part of the reason they hadn't seen a great uptake was that there wasn't the infrastructure to grind the wheat into flour. That is to say, there wasn't really a ready access to local mills for most hapu, at least in the Bay of Islands where this information was coming from. Given the aforementioned quote, that seems like a reasonable idea. Constructing mills would help ease the burden of processing wheat, and by extension, get Māori to adopt it more readily. On this account, the missionaries seem to have been correct, and by 1839, nearly all iwi in the Bay of Islands were growing at least a little bit of wheat, with the same trend being seen across the whole country's coastal regions. I should stress though, that this wasn't because Māori were necessarily convinced by the missionaries, or that they suddenly saw the light of how great bread is, because let's be frank here, bread is pretty great, but more because there was a demand for it among Europeans, and Māori saw this for what it was, an excellent trading opportunity. Maize was introduced to Aotearoa around the same time as wheat, sometime in the early 1770s, and also similarly to wheat, was unsuccessful and didn't really see any major adoption until 1813, and even then, it probably wasn't grown in any great quantity. With the aid of missionaries, maize was grown more and more, until in 1830 Samuel Marsden, another missionary, said that the amount of maize in the Bay of Islands was comparable to that of New South Wales in Australia. Seven years later, maize would be present across the North Island coast, particularly the East Coast. It was also at this point that a company in Sydney imported 1,000 bushels of maize from Poverty Bay, so it was clearly doing pretty well. It probably goes without saying at this point, but it seems that Māori valued maize as a cash crop, rather than something edible, much like all the other European crops we've talked about. This would have been down to the same reason Māori had issues getting into wheat. They didn't really know how to prepare it for eating. They did take a good crack at it though, using techniques that they were familiar with, such as scraping off the outer husk with shells and soaking them in water to make them soft. Once mills became more widespread, they then changed to a more European method. We also see evidence of orchard trees being grown in the Bay of Islands as well, such as peaches, apples, quince and oranges. Though apparently Māori often harvested them before they were ripe, likely for the same sort of reasons as potatoes, to capitalise on trade. Watermelon was quite popular as well, with one source commenting on how much Māori really liked it. However, I hesitate to call that fact, as there is a non-zero chance it is meant to be a racist comment. If you recall back to a couple of episodes ago, we discussed all about weeds, in particular some European weeds like dock and sorrel. By the 1830s, both of these were widespread in the Bay of Islands, along with other European weeds. Some were introduced by accident, being carried amongst the seeds of crops, while others were brought over deliberately for various purposes. Sometimes it was kept in the garden, until they realised it was out of control and essentially escaped, as was the case with a missionary who cultivated scotch thistle. In another case that I alluded to in that previous episode, Doc was allegedly introduced by the captain of a ship who sold the seeds to Māori under the guise that they were tobacco. Let's move on from plants and take a quick look at the tools Europeans introduced and what Māori thought of them. The three most important tools that were introduced were the axe, spade and hoe, which should hopefully make sense given what those tools are for and what Māori were predominantly doing in the horticultural space. Less widely used were the mattock, pickaxe, rake and sickle. Again, given what we know, that should make sense. As with most of this episode, missionaries were the big driving force behind Māori adopting these tools, though they were helped by traders and other ships. The key difference was that the new tools were made of metal, whereas Māori tools were made of stone, bone or pounamu, depending on the tool, and even then, the ones made of pounamu were often ceremonial. So metal tools were much more efficient, with Marsden estimating that in 1823, 
crop cultivation had increased 40 times within the last decade. Additionally, it is thought that land cultivation in the Bay of Islands increased 10 times between 1814 and 1819. Kind of related to this, Marsden also said, quote, To give a man a spade is not like giving him a hundred pounds of potatoes to supply his immediate wants, but it is furnishing him with the means of raising many hundreds, end quote. The only reason I really bring this up is because it's basically an old-timey version of that give a man a fish quote, and I thought that was kind of funny. Going back to the increased productivity from metal tools, well, it wasn't all because of that. There was also the fact there was an increased demand for crops via trade, so Māori made the effort to ramp up production. Metal tools did make this ramp up easier, so there is a kind of swings and roundabouts thing going on here. For example, now that Māori had metal axes, it was much easier to cut down fresh forest for cultivation. Though, missionaries weren't too keen on this, because it meant a lot of native timber was lost, which was extremely valuable at the time. The problem with this in particular was that just because they were able to cut down trees easier, that didn't change the fertility of the soil. So Māori still used their tried and tested method of cultivating on a piece of land for a few years and then leaving it fallow for a few years more. The person that really pioneered the use of metal tools in New Zealand was, of course, David Taiwanga. In particular, he really pushed the use of the metal plough, which no other iwi was using at the time. This lack of widespread use among Māori was mostly down to them not having enough funds or goods to trade for one. Because they were hella expensive. But also because they required beasts of burden to pull them. Something that wasn't present in Aotearoa at the time. Or at least had not been introduced from Europe in enough numbers to make it viable. This did eventually change though. All of this isn't to say that European tools replaced Māori ones entirely. Most iwi in the Bay of Islands, for example, still used the same tools they always had. There was just a few more in the toolbox now. In the case of more inland areas, Māori didn't have a lot of contact with Europeans. It was just too difficult for them to get that far into the interior. So metal tools were much rarer in those areas, and as such, quite highly prized. One thing you're probably wondering at this point is, why did missionaries give so much of a shit about what Māori were eating? On the face of it, missionaries whose job it is to Christianise a population, and the food that population is eating, doesn't seem all that linked, other than the cultural practices around it. However, it is possible that some missionaries had the same view that Marsden did, in that Christianity was linked to civilization and civilized society, which in itself was linked to European agriculture. So he took every opportunity he could to teach Māori about these methods, also instructing the missionaries under him to do the same, saying, quote, It will be a grand object with me to promote agriculture amongst the chiefs as much as possible. When their necessary wants are supplied, they will be more disposed to lay aside their warlike habits and to attend the simple arts of civilization. End quote. Essentially, he is saying that because Māori don't have enough food, they are more preoccupied with fighting each other over resources than building castles or writing books. Which is not to say that there aren't elements of truth in there. Like, part of the reason Māori were fighting each other was over resources. But why does any kingdom or culture fight each other? This isn't exactly unique to Māori. This is of course ignoring the racist undertones that Māori didn't have civilization. But I hope you can understand the general idea I'm trying to get across, in that this quote is pretty bollocks. Eventually, Marsden left Aotearoa to live in New South Wales, Australia. But that didn't stop him trying to teach Māori about agriculture, apparently. He established a seminary in 1817 whose express purpose was to teach Māori about European technologies like agriculture, blacksmithing, spinning and weaving. Why he didn't just set this up in New Zealand, who's to say? 
But 24 Māori had attended the seminary by the time it was closed down in 1819, two years after it had opened. The reason for this was that Māori were being exposed to more European diseases that their bodies just weren't equipped to deal with, but also because they couldn't handle the change in living conditions. It's not really expanded on as to what this means specifically, unless it means the close quarter conditions of European towns and the aforementioned diseases that result. But my guess would be that it also refers to the Australian heat, given it is much hotter over there, to the point where a kiwi can melt. I speak from personal experience here. Whatever the case, 13 Māori died at the seminary, or shortly after their return to Aotearoa, forcing Marsden to shut down. I should point out that this isn't to say that all missionaries held the same views as Marsden, but there was at least a not insignificant group that did. When it came to tapu, it was still pretty strictly observed for planting and harvesting, almost right up until 1840, and maybe even beyond in some areas, which caused a bit of tension between Māori and the missionaries, who weren't too keen on things they deemed pagan or unchristian. As you might expect though, the more Māori interacted with Europeans and were exposed to their religion, ideas and culture, tapu was gradually eroded, even by those who were fervently against Christianity. From the European side, this was done both on purpose and by accident. For example, by 1826, eating in the whare was quite common for Māori, something that was basically unheard of before this. These changes, along with all the changes we have talked about, were mostly taken up by the younger generations, who were more open to change than their older, more stuck-in-their-ways parents or grandparents. Additionally, communal quote-unquote ownership of the land was still practiced for a long time, which missionaries thought was a bit of a hindrance to what they were trying to achieve, because it meant that the quote-unquote owner would be more likely to share their goods with the community, rather than trade it to the missionaries themselves or their countrymen. As such, Europeans had an interest in breaking down tapu, which in turn aided in lessening the authority of rangatira, which then broke down the cohesion of the community, which then made it easier to buy land off them. And you're probably sick of me saying this, but this is a theme we will most certainly be coming back to later in the podcast. To finish off this already rather long episode, let's talk a bit about what was going on in the most southern regions of New Zealand. By that, I mean south of Banks Peninsula and modern-day Christchurch. Just like most other places in the country, the introduction of potatoes was a pretty big deal. Māori in the Lower South Island weren't able to cultivate kumara and other similar foods, instead relying on hunting and fishing. So when a plant came along that could be cultivated in the harsher climate, it made a big impact. Given this new food source, the population increased substantially. As to how potatoes got there though, is a little bit of a mystery. Some say that the southern South Island wasn't permanently inhabited until potatoes were introduced, basically meaning that Kaitahu, the local iwi, were able to move down into these colder regions now that they had a more readily available food source. This was described as, quote, an explosive extension into the less favoured climatic region, even before the presence of Europeans made such a move desirable from a trade point of view. End quote. However, in saying this, the idea is based on shaky evidence, apparently being recounted by a single man who was quite advanced in age when he told the story. The more likely theory is that potatoes were introduced by sealers to Murihiku, Southland, after Fovo Strait was mapped in 1804. Sealers were expected to spend long periods living off their own resources, so they usually carried seed potatoes to plant in areas that they could harvest them from. As such, we see multiple instances of potato fields being laid out by Europeans in coastal Southland, and of course trade occurring between them and Māori. From that, we know Māori were already in the region before potatoes were available to them, So this idea that the area was too cold to survive and that Māori needed potatoes to be there 
just doesn't seem to be the case. Instead, what looks to have happened is that Māori just had no reason to be down there. They had no migration pressures forcing them south, whether that be lack of food, land, war, famine, or something else. They were doing just fine further north, so there was no need to move. That changed when Europeans turned up, though, and the pressure came as an immigration pressure rather than emigration pressure. It suddenly became advantageous to be further south, where Europeans were hanging out, because that meant much more trade opportunities. Despite this, Māori was still getting a pretty raw deal. In 1813 Bluff, just south of Invercargill, one nail cost 55 kgs of potatoes, and in 1827 Otago, an iron adds cost 1,600 kgs of potatoes. This didn't seem to deter Kaitahu in these early years though, as they likely saw the addition of these new technologies to their repertoire to be well worth it. Next time, for our final episode of the horrific year that has been 2020, we will be doing a dramatic retelling of a Māori story. I haven't decided yet what it will be, so if you have one you want to hear, please let me know. This is our final episode on Māori horticulture. Hopefully I haven't bored too many of you with my talk of plants and dirt. I have thoroughly enjoyed it, so I hope you have as well. Our next major segment will be on fishing. That will start sometime in the new year. But I am probably a bit behind on getting those episodes researched and written, so I'm hoping to have some other interesting stuff for you in the meantime. But I may finish those episodes in time, we'll just see how we get on. But it's shaping up to be as chonky as a kiridu, just like these episodes were. So you have been warned. If you want to send me feedback, ask a question, suggest a topic, or just have a chinwag, you can find my email and social media on historyaotearoa.com. Aotearoa spelt A-O-T-E-A-R-O-A. This podcast is a one-man band. If you enjoy listening to me talk history, you can support us through Patreon, buy merch, or give us a review. It means a lot and helps spread the story of Aotearoa New Zealand. As always, haere tu atu, hoki tu mai. See you next time.